Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem parallel courses three. We're given n courses or nodes in a graph and they're labeled from one to n this time. Usually they're labeled from zero to n minus one, but I guess they wanted to be a bit more annoying for this problem. But otherwise, the problem isn't super complicated. You can see this is an example graph. We're also given an array of relations, which is basically an array of edges. So it will map a source node to a destination node like this. Now, we're given a second array as well called time because Every one of these courses takes some amount of time to complete it. So the first course here, you can't see it super well, but it takes three months. This one takes two months. This one takes five months. So one kind of naive way to think about it would be like, just take this time and add it to the edge. And technically that would work. We could put a three there and a two there, but what about the last node? It still takes five months to complete this node, but it's not like we have to traverse from here to null. While you can kind of do it this way, it's better to just not. Like every time we visit a node, we're going to accumulate the total amount of time for every single node. So like if we were to take like a path like this, we would just aggregate the time for every single node that we visited along the path. We don't have to think about it in terms of like the edge. But that kind of gets me to what this question is asking of us. If we were to take all of these courses, how long would it take? And the good thing here is that we're actually allowed to take many courses in parallel if we want to, like an unbounded amount. So that makes things very, very easy for us. And we can start at any of the courses. So of course, we're going to start at the prerequisites and take as many courses as we possibly can. We can take these two courses in parallel. Even though we can finish this one in two months, this one takes three months, we can't actually start on this one until we've completed not only this one, but also this one. So, so we wanna know what's the minimum number of months it's gonna take us to complete all of the courses. And another good thing that's gonna make things simple for us is that we're guaranteed that this is a directed acyclical graphs. So there's never going to be a cycle. There's never going to be a loop, but we're not guaranteed that this graph is actually connected. Like we might have another node here connected to another node here, and these two portions of the graph are just not connected, but that's not a problem for us. Now, even though they're asking for the minimum number of months it's gonna to take to complete all the courses, we are gonna run some traversal here. You could either do a DFS or a BFS. I'm gonna stick with DFS because it's gonna make things pretty easy for us. But suppose from here, like we take a path starting at two, we visit this node and then we take this node as well. We know that the total for that was two months plus five months, that's gonna give us seven months. But the other path from here actually took us three plus five months. So that was eight months total. So a naive way to solve this problem would be to take the minimum of those two paths, but that's not actually what we want. We actually want to return the maximum of all of these paths because this is the bottleneck. We know that this had multiple prerequisites just because we finished one of them doesn't mean we were actually able to take this course. So that's kind of the idea of solving this problem. And even though they say return the minimum number of months it would take, that's kind of just another way of saying that we can take as many courses in parallel as we want to. That's how we're minimizing this. So when it comes to DFS, how we're going to solve this problem is not necessarily starting at every single source node. That would be one valid way to do it, but you can imagine that this graph could be even bigger. So suppose we tried that. Suppose we ran a DFS here. So we get to this guy, then we get to this guy, then we eventually get to this guy, and then we would kind of backtrack and then get to this guy as well. So we would calculate the length of this path and the length of this path, well not really the length, but we would aggregate like the total time for each of the paths and we would keep track of those. Now also we would do the same thing when we get here. We'd visit this node, then we'd visit this node, then we'd visit this node and we would keep track of the maximum of these paths. But isn't that repeated work? Why should we have to visit this node multiple times? And when we do visit the node, 
what should we save? Like for this node, we're keeping track of the maximum path starting from here. And for this node, we're also doing the same. What was the maximum path starting from here? Shouldn't we do the same thing for this sub problem? Because suppose like this node had one month and this node had two months from here, we would say, okay, it takes five months for this node and we can choose to go here. That's five plus one, that's six. And then the other path is five plus two, that's seven. So we should just save the fact that this was the maximum path starting from here. Let's just save a seven here now. And next time any ancestor visits us, we just return that seven automatically. So this will guarantee that we don't visit a node more than a single time. We don't do any sort of repeated work and therefore the time complexity will be the size of the graph. Let's say that's the number of edges plus the number of vertices. And the space complexity will actually be the same because we're gonna need to build an adjacency list. So that's the idea of solving this problem. Now, the last thing I wanna mention is we don't have to start at these beginning nodes because we're guaranteeing that we don't do any repeated work. If we started the DFS from here, we would end up visiting this and visiting this and visiting this. Eventually we will visit all of these nodes as well. And as long as we're keeping track of the maximum time for every single node, we will be able to return the maximum among all of the starting positions or all of the possible starting positions. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run a DFS starting from every single node and caching the result. So that's kind of a dynamic programming technique, caching the maximum time starting from every potential course. Now let's code this up. So the first thing I'm going to do is build an adjacency list. We know we're given a list of edges, but it's typically a lot easier to have an adjacency list. So I'm here creating a hash map where the default value is going to be an empty list. And the reason for that is because we're going to iterate over every source destination pair in our list of relations, AKA edges. And for every source node, we're going to append to the list of its neighbors, the destination node. The reason we can do this, even if this was not necessarily a key already existent in, in the adjacency list is because by default, it's going to be a list. That's what this does, a hash map where this will by default map to an empty list if the key does not already exist. Next, we're going to have our DFS. So the DFS is only gonna take a single parameter, the current source node. But what we're trying to do with the DFS, how we're gonna call this is for every single i in range from one to n plus one, remember we can't just go from zero to n because that's just how this problem was defined. We're given the number of nodes, but they're from one to n, so. That's why we go up until one plus or n plus one. Now for every node, we're gonna consider it the starting point. So we're gonna run DFS starting from there. But what the DFS is going to do is map for that starting node, what was the maximum time it took for us to finish or basically reach the end of the graph because we know it's a directed acyclical graph. So every source should map to some maximum time. And once we do that, you could keep track of like the maximum time in a separate variable and just take like the max every time we call this, but that's not necessary and it doesn't really change the overall time complexity. So we can also just do this, return the max of all the values in the max time hash map. So this also actually works. And again, it doesn't really change the overall time complexity. But now the only thing left for us to do is actually fill out this DFS. And what's the base case here? Because we'll actually never pass in null or anything like that for this, because as we do the DFS, we're always gonna go over the neighbors of every source node. We're gonna go through the neighbors with the adjacency list, and it's not like we're inserting null anywhere in here. So the main base case is gonna be, if we've already visited this source before, we've already computed the max time for that. Basically, source already exists in the max time hash, hash map. Uh, so then we're gonna return whatever the max time that we mapped for that source node was. Now, if that's not the case, then we're actually gonna compute the max time. So I'm gonna compute that in a variable called result. 
And we know that at the very least, it takes us a certain amount of time to complete this current course. So I'm not going to initialize the result to zero. I'm actually going to initialize it to however much time it takes us to complete this course. And then we're going to go through every neighbor for this course. It's possible that this node does not have any neighbors. If it doesn't have any neighbors, then we would just return the result, which was however much time it took us to complete this one course. But if it does have some neighbors, we're going to iterate over them and we're going to call DFS for that neighbor. Now we're trying to maximize this. Remember, we're trying to maximize the amount of time. So we're going to set result equal to the max of possibly itself or not just the time it takes for us to run a DFS on the neighbor. But remember, we're including the current course as well. So we're going to hear, say, a time of source plus the result of the DFS. And I just realized that since the nodes are actually starting at one, we can't just use the source here. We have to say source minus one when we are talking about the time, at least. That's just how the problem was presented for us. So I'm going to do that. And here I'm also going to do a minus one. OK, now, last thing before we return, let's not forget to actually store the max result in the max time hash map. So that's what I'm going to do here. Max time for the current node is going to be mapped to the result. So there we go. That is the entire code. Now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.